Let's quickly look at the main aspects of India's 33, which deals with EPS. When I talk about EPS, the question is, is this a recognition standard or is this a measurement standard or is this a disclosure standard? It's a pure presentation and measurement standard. It is about presentation of EPS in the financial statements and measurement of how do I calculate this value of EPS. The standard broadly talks about the presentation of two figures in your statement of PNL. Below the statement of PNL, on the face of the financial statements itself, we require to demonstrate or present two items. One is called as a basic EPS, other one is called as a diluted EPS. Your basic and diluted EPS are supposed to be presented on the face of the PNL itself. Now, when I'm presenting it right on the face of the PNL, I should know how to measure it as well. So, what is this concept of basic EPS? Let's deal with it first. Then we can come back into the concept of diluted EPS. First, when I'm looking at the concept of basic EPS, basic EPS is nothing but given as pace by veins. Profits available to equity shareholders divided by weighted average number of equity shares. By presenting basic EPS, what is the advantage to the enterprise? Objective is what? I am communicating it to the user that per share I earn so much of value. How will this help? Last year presentation, it will get, enable my comparison in the current year. Last year, I had a paid up capital of 10 lakhs on which I made a profit of 1,50,000. Current year, my paid up capital has increased to 20 lakhs. So what is the current year profit and how do I compare it with the last year profit? Can I tell you that I have actually had a better profit or I have a lower profit? This comparison with the previous year is possible with the help of EPS. I can also have a benchmarking as well. My EPS is 2.4. Another company which is my competitor in the same industry is presenting an EPS of only 1.8. Therefore, I am doing better than my competitor. My work on capital employed or my return on capital employed is much better. This is a comparison with the industry peer or the industry benchmarks. And also remember your EPS is a very important metric in measurement of market price per share. Your stock market moves around in the valuation based on P into EPS. Your EPS into P is the formula based on which your stock market moves. Forget about P, but EPS now has become a significant factor in determining the market price. That is why you find a lot of companies fluctuate in their market price exactly on the day on which the quarterly results are presented. Company did way better than what it is expected from the company in a particular quarter. Automatically, the price of the company jumps. That is because the multiplier of EPS is increasing. Clear? So that is predominantly the reason why EPS becomes very, very important and we determine basic EPS with the simple formula of pace by weights. Profits available to equity shareholders divided by weighted average number of equity shares. Break this down into parts. Numerator part separate, denominator part separate. Let's first discuss about the numerator part that is profits available to equity shareholders on how do I determine this profits available to equity shareholders. PAS or profits available to equity shareholders is equal to profit after tax minus the amount of preference dividend. The amount of profit after payment of taxes to the government out of the balance profit after if I pay the preference dividend, the balance profits are available for distribution to equity shareholders. So it is given as profit after tax minus preference dividend. But with respect to preference dividend, is it compulsory to pay preference dividend always? Not necessary. I may not declare the dividend for a particular year. Should I still deduct preference dividend? The answer will depend upon what is the classification of your preference shares. If your preference share is cumulative in nature, then preference dividend will be deducted in determination of PAS, whether the dividend is declared or not. Why? 
because for a cumulative preference share, if you don't pay the preference of dividend of current year, you will have to pay it in the subsequent years. Therefore, if a preference share is of cumulative nature, in determination of PAES, I will have to deduct the amount of preference dividend, whether the dividend is declared or not. However, if this preference share is non-cumulative in nature, then the preference dividend shall be deducted in determination of PAES only if the dividend is declared. If the dividend is not declared, then you don't have to deduct preference dividend from the profit after tax to determine your profits available to equity shareholders. One more aspect I found. Current year preference dividend I deducted because my preference shares are cumulative in nature. What if last two years I did not pay preference dividend so they are appearing as areas of preference dividend. Should the area be deducted? Not necessary. Because you are deducting preference dividend every year in the case of cumulative preference shares, areas of preference dividend need not be deducted. So, preference pro profits available to equity shareholder is equal to profit after tax minus preference dividend. Such preference dividend on cumulative preference share should be deducted whether dividend is declared or not. But on non-cumulative preference share, it should be deducted only if the dividend is declared. Guys, please make the correction when you get the notes. It should be only if the dividend is declared. If the dividend is not declared, then you are not supposed to deduct the amount of dividend from uh, profit after tax to determine PAES if the preference shares are non-cumulative in nature. Areas of preference dividend which appear for cumulative preference share should not be deducted in determination of profits available to equity shareholders. Now, this is my discussion regarding the deduction of preference dividend from profit after tax to, de to determine my PAS. But what is your profit after tax? Your profit after tax should be the amount that appears in the statement of PNL after the deduction of provision for tax. However, there is a certain adjustment to profit after tax. He says, any item, any item which is adjusted against the reserves of the company, which otherwise would have been debited to PNL. An item which has been adjusted to the reserves of the company, which otherwise would have been adjusted to the PNL or debited to the PNL. Such items should be deducted in determination of profit after tax. Let's say I have the concept of preliminary expenses. Preliminary expenses can either be amortized to PNL or can be adjusted from securities premium. Let's say an enterprise has securities premium, so the amount of preliminary expenses got adjusted against securities premium. However, if that securities premium was not there, it would have been debited to PNL. Therefore, he says, an item like a preliminary expense should be adjusted in determination of profit after tax if it is adjusted to or if it is adjusted to a particular reserve otherwise would have been debited to PNL. Look at what he says here. Expenses or losses adjusted against a reserve which otherwise would have been debited to PNL should be deducted from profit after tax in determination of PAS. Impairment loss as per India is 36 if it is adjusted against revaluation surplus. Impairment loss should be debited to PNL. But if there is a revaluation surplus, then you can adjust this impairment loss against revaluation surplus. Such amount which is adjusted to a reserve, otherwise would have been debited to PNL, should be reduced or deducted in computation of PAT, profit after tax. Preliminary expenses are loss on issue of debentures adjusted against securities premium. If the securities premium was not there, I would have debited them to PNL. Therefore, such items should be reduced from profit after tax even though they are actually adjusted to another reserve. Clear? Now let's come to the denominator part. Numerator PIS, we said profit after tax minus preference dividend. Profit after tax, I said all those items which were adjusted to a reserve, which otherwise would have been debited to PNL, 
should be reduced in determination of profit after tax. Preference dividend, we have seen cumulative and non-cumulative preference share treatment. That will end our discussion regarding profits available to equity shareholders. Let's come to the concept of weights, weighted average number of equity shares, which is the denominator part. In determination of denominator weights, we have to apply this formula. Number of equity shares outstanding at the beginning of the period, adjusted by plus or minus, shares issued plus or shares bought back minus during the period. These number of shares has to be multiplied with a time weighting factor, which is called as TWF. What is this TWF or time weighting factor? It is the number of days for which specific number of shares are outstanding during the period divided by total number of days during the period. So I'm saying number of equity shares outstanding at the beginning of the period adjusted by shares issued or bought back during the period multiplied by time weighting factor. Time weighting factor is equal to number of days for which specific number of shares are outstanding during the period divided by total number of days during the period. Let's say what I'm talking about. Let's say for example, on 1st of April 2021, I had the total number of shares were about 10,000. Exactly on 30th of June 2021, there was an issue of shares Let's say the issue of shares were 5,000. Let's say again on 30th of, uh, on 31st of December, there was a buyback. Buyback, let's say is of 2,000 shares. If I have to calculate weighted average number of equity shares in this case, WNES, I'll calculate like this. First, identify first identify number of equity shares multiplied with time weighting factor and then get your total. How many shares were at the beginning of the period? 10,000. Subsequently on 30th of June, towards the end of June, he issued 5,000 shares. Total number of shares became 15,000. But on 31st of December, it has become 13,000 after buyback of 2,000 shares. The dates which are relevant out here is 1st April, 30th June, 31st December. Time waiting factor is the number of days for which specific number of shares are outstanding. Let's say here I can take it as 3 by 12, 6 by 12, 3 by 12. I got the answer as 2500, 7500 and lastly 13,000 divided by 4. Three thousand two fifty. So my weighted average number of shares are thirteen thousand. However, someone would say, looking at the definition back again, they would come up to me and say, "Sir, your answer is wrong, because you said time weighting factor should be calculated in number of days. But however, when you showed the illustration, you calculated in." Number of months, you might say you're absolutely wrong. But I say that, yes, 
you are right to a certain extent that my time waiting factor are wrong however my answer of 13,000 to 50 is absolutely right I'll say how is that possible let me tell you my answer is absolutely right because he said your time waiting factor though should be taken in number of days in most circumstances a reasonable approximation of veins is considered to be sufficient in most circumstances a reasonable approximation of weighted average number of equity shares is considered to be sufficient since he said a weighted average uh, a, a reasonable approximation is sufficient since they are almost towards the end of each month yes if you calculate a number of days there might be a little bit of change but you can say that veins of 13,250 is a reasonable approximation therefore your answer should be considered as right but if i go strictly with the definition yes time waiting factor should have been calculated based on number of days during a period for which specific number of shares are outstanding divided by total number of shares during the period clear now to veins there are certain adjustments that we have to see predominantly i'll classify these into only two categories first adjustment is where i have partly paid shares or shares of different nominal value i have shares of 10 rupees each fully paid up 10 rupees each 8 paid up 10 rupees each 5 paid up these are partly paid shares shares of different nominal value 10 rupees fully paid up 10 rupees 8 paid up 5 rupees fully paid up 5 rupees only 4 paid up so partly paid along with different nominal value so whenever i have and uh, uh, shares in this way where there are multiple partly paid shares or different nominal value shares i will have to apply the logic of veins by considering an equivalent number of shares what did i say i said whenever i have the situation of partly paid shares or different nominal values partly paid shares oblique different nominal value that means the face value of share is different in such cases i will apply wanes based on equivalent number of shares equivalent number of equity shares what is this equivalent number of equity shares and how do we calculate equivalent number of equity shares can be calculated like this it is nothing but total paid up value divided by x why x if i divide it by x i will get equal a number of uh, equal a number of shares of x rupees each if i divide it by 10 that is equal a number of 10 rupees share let's see with the help of example let's say i have 1000 shares of rupee 10 each fully paid up okay along with that i also have 1000 shares of rupee 10 8 paid up or I have 500 shares of rupee 5 fully paid along with that I have 500 shares of 5 rupees each 4 paid up
whenever I come across this kind of scenario, you might consider a total saying that the total number of shares are 3000. But I am saying veins should not be considered based on this total number of shares. But veins should be considered based on equivalent number of shares. How do I calculate equivalent number of shares? Calculate. Find out what is the total paid up value. What is the total paid up value? Paid up value is equal to calculate. First case 10,000. Second case 8,000. Third case 2,500. Lastly 2,000. What is the total paid up value from this? The total paid up value is 22,500. Therefore, if I calculate equal and number of shares, therefore, equivalent number of equity shares of rupee 10 each. If I have to calculate 10 rupees equal and number of shares, divide the paid up capital divided by 10. So that will be 2250. If I want to calculate equivalent number of shares of rupee 5 each, then total paid up value should be divided by 5 rupees. That will be 4500. This way, by dividing by the value, you will get equivalent number of such number of equity shares. Clear? This is the first concept that will come across as an adjustment to weights. The first adjustment is regarding partly paid shares or shares with different nominal value. Consider equivalent number of shares in computation of weights. What is the second adjustment then? The second adjustment to weights is regarding increase in number of shares without commensurate increase in net assets. I'm saying increase in number of shares without corresponding increase in enterprise resources. I'll tell you what it means. I'm saying, if I look at the factors of equity shares, and enterprise resources, enterprise resources are nothing but net assets. Enterprise resources are nothing but net assets the relationship between these two is that both of them move in the same direction if i issue shares for cash then automatically i have to make sure that even your net assets increase because cash increased if there is a decrease in the value of equity shares by back then even your equity shares also reduce shares issued for an asset Equity shares increased, net assets also increased. Shares issued for conversion of debenture, equity share increased, debenture reduced, ultimately debenture reduced, net asset increases. So therefore the relationship is directly relational. That means they are directly relational. However, I am saying sometimes there happens to be a change in number of shares without commensurate change in enterprise resource. Without corresponding change in enterprise resource, enterprise resources are constant, but there is a change in number of shares. It happens whenever I do a stock split. For one 10 rupee share, the company issued two 5 rupee share. Total number of shares become double. Net assets change? No. Few shares were issued as bonus to existing shareholders. Reserves are capitalized as bonus. Net asset remains same number of equity shares increased. Whenever we come across this concept where there is a change in number of shares without commensurate change in enterprise resources, that should be my second adjustment. In such case, I will assume that the change has occurred at the beginning of earliest period reported. What do you mean by beginning of earliest period reported? Let's say for the current year 2021-22, there is a bonus issue on 15th August. For current year 21-22, I am declaring bonus issue on 15th August. What is the earliest period reported in financial statements? Comparative previous year. What is my comparative previous year? 
2021. In 2021, at the beginning of earliest period reported, what is the beginning of earliest period reported? 1st April 2020. Therefore, such increase in number of shares without corresponding increase in enterprise resource should be assumed to have occurred at the beginning of earliest period reported that is 1st April 2020. Similar example I have given down below. You can check right beside me. Right? I have given for the financial year 1819 and I am showing this. Now someone will come up with a very tricky question on why. Why is one of the very very irritating as well as a very tricky question. Let me answer why. I will take the example of stock split. Okay. In a stock split, it so happened that X Limited issued 2 rupee 5 shares for each rupee 10 share. stock split for example if your pa is previous year was 10 lakhs current year was 12 lakhs and your number of equity shares For previous year were 10,000. Current year because of stock split they became 20,000. Calculate your EPS based on this. What is your EPS based on this? My EPS of previous year 10 lakhs divided by 10,000 is nothing but 100. Well my current year is how much? 60. If I would have reported this information of 160 to you, what is your contention? You would come up to me and say that, Sir, last year they earned 100 rupees per share. Current year they earned only 60. The performance deteriorated. Is that true? No. If you look at the profit, the profit actually increased by 20%. I can't see that in the EPS. So what am I saying? So assume that this 20,000 or additional 10,000 shares are issued at the beginning of last year itself. Therefore, this last year's 100 rupees will be restated. And instead of doing divide 10 lakh divided by 10,000, I'll do 10 lakh divided by 20,000 and the restated EPS is 50. Now is it comparable? It is comparable. Last year EPS 50, current year EPS 60 increased by 20%. Exactly the same increase even near PAS. Therefore, it truly represents the pattern or it truly represents the affairs of the business. So if I would have reported previous year as 100 and current year as 60, it would have resulted in a material misinformation. That is the reason why you will also always have to assume that whenever there is a change in shares without, without corresponding change in the enterprise resources, they are issued at the beginning of earliest period reported. Guys, even right shares have a bonus element. Why do right shares have bonus element? I'll tell you. Right shares are issued to the existing shareholders at a discounted price. Current market price is 100 rupees, but to my existing shareholders, I am giving them a right to subscribe each share only at 80 rupees. That discount of 20 rupees is a bonus. This bonus can be identified in the form of number of shares. My bonus element, 
to uh, to the extent that i have to consider as if these shares were issued at the beginning of earlier period reported he said should be computed like this shares at the beginning of the year before bonus sorry before rights issue into raf minus 1 number of shares before rights issue into raf minus 1 is equal to bonus element in rights issue what is raf rights adjusting factor rights adjusting factor is equal to fair value of a share before right divided by theoretical x rights price fair value before right divided by theoretical rights or uh, theoretical value of the share post rights how do you calculate theoretical x rights price number of shares which existed before rights multiplied by fair value of share before rights plus proceeds from rights issue divided by number of shares post rights let's understand this with the help of an example Let's say, for example, number of equity shares outstanding in the company are 10,000. Rights were offered in the ratio of one share for every two shares held. That is 5,000 right shares. My exercise price under rights is let's say 80 rupees per share. While my market price or fair value per share on the day of rights issue is obviously higher than the excise price 100 rupees per share now based on this if i have to calculate what is the bonus element in rights issue bonus element in rights issue is equal to Ten thousand shares, number of shares before rights, multiplied by R A F minus one. How do I calculate this R A F? How do I calculate this R A F? Let's see. R A F is equal to fair value before rights. What is fair value before rights? I've already given you fair value exactly on the date of rights issue is 100 divided by theoretical x rights price. I have to calculate theoretical x rights price. So let's try to calculate this theoretical x rights price. Theoretical X rights price is equal to Theoretical X rights price per share is equal to What is the total number of shares before rights? 10,000. What is the fair value of those shares? 100 rupees. Plus, how much did I collect from rights issue? Total rights were 5,000 shares. From each right share, I am collecting 80 rupees divided by total number of, uh, of shares after rights is 15,000. So, this is how much 10 lakhs plus 4 lakhs, 14 lakhs divided by 15,000. It will give me an answer of 93.33. So, RAF is equal to 100 divided by 93.33. 100 divided by 93.33 is equal to 1.071.
go and apply this bonus element in rights issue is equal to 10,000 into 1.071 minus 1 into 10,000 there you get something around 71 shares 714 shares or you can actually take 710 guys to round it off because I took only 3 decimals 710 bonus shares so out of the 5000 right shares that I got 710 shares are bonus shares what do I expect these 710 shares were issued at the beginning of earliest period reported that means at the beginning of previous year itself so how many bonus shares should be considered at full consideration out of 5710 is bonus therefore the balance 4290 shares should be considered as full consideration shares while the 710 shares are bonus which are considered as zero consideration shares clear this is regarding bonus element in rights issue once we are done with this concept we get into the concept of something called as diluted eps what is this concept of diluted eps and why does it arise this concept arises because an enterprise could have certain contracts or instrument today which are not equity shares but they are potential to receive equity shares in future convertible preference shares convertible bonds convertible preference uh, con uh, your uh, convertible bonds or convertible debentures options share warrants uh, unpaid capital all these are potential equity shares they have a potential to increase your weighted average number of equity shares in the computation of your basic eps potentially they can increase the amount of denominator whenever you are calculating the eps if the denominator increases what happens to the eps eps falls down this fall in the value of eps is called as diluted eps convertible debenture or convertible bond or convertible uh, preference share what will happen until then it was a preference share or a debenture or a bond now it became share so now i will consider it in computation of weighted average number of equity shares denominator increases automatically your eps falls this fall in value is diluted eps options employees have certain options they can exercise to receive shares once they receive shares, again denominator increases. Partly paid up shares. To the extent of unpaid capital, if they pay up the capital, if there's a call and they pay, automatically your partly paid shares will become fully paid shares. If they were partly paid shares, I was taking equal a number of shares. Now once they become fully paid up, I have to take the complete share. Denominator again increases. This is the concept of diluted EPS which is arising from the concept of potential equity shares. They are instruments or contracts which are not equity shares today, but they entitle the holder to receive equity shares in future. Whenever I calculate a diluted EPS, I use the formula of profits available to equity shareholders plus increase in profits divided by weighted average number of equity shares plus increase in weighted average number of equity shares. Whenever I talk about a, a, a di diluted EPS, I'll have to identify first the potential equity shares in the company. After you identify potential equity shares, I will assign a dilution factor to each potential equity share. What is a dilution factor? Dilution factor can be designated as Increase in numerator by increase in denominator. Increase in profits available to equity shareholders divided by increase in weighted average number of equity shares. Now let's say for example I am talking about convertible preference shares. Preference share when they convert into equity in computation of PIES profits available to equity shareholders I don't have to deduct preference dividend anymore. If you remember PIES calculation what was it? Profit after tax minus preference dividend if these preference shares are converted into equity i don't have to deduct preference dividend therefore the increase in profits are in, are to the extent of preference dividend 
divided by increase in number of equity shares is the shares issued upon conversion. If I talk about bonds and debentures which are convertible, increase in numerator is their amount of debenture or bond interest. But since I take after tax, so this bond interest or debenture interest should also be adjusted for tax. So debenture interest or bond interest into 1 minus tax divided by increase in denominator number of shares allotted to these debenture holders on conversion. Whenever I have options, there is no increase in numerator. There is no increase in profits available to equity shareholder. However, I have a denominator. The denominator is options exercised at nil consideration. How do I get this options exercised at nil consideration? Let's say I have a certain option whose fair value is 100. The exercise price of option is only 80. Number of options which I have is about 500. If I would have actually issued the options or if the options are actually exercised, how much they would have collected? 500 options into 80 rupees per option, they would have collected 40,000 rupees. If I would have issued these options at MRP or the fair value 100 rupees, then I would have issued only 400 options. But because the option exercise price is less than market price, I am issuing 500 options. Therefore, the difference between these two 500 and 400 is called as options exercised at nil consideration. That should be the increase in the denominator. Now, whenever you try to calculate your uh, diluted EPS, remember the steps that you have to follow. Number one, first determine what is your basic EPS. Step two, identify potential equity shares. Step three, calculate the amount of dilution factor in each potential equity share. Dilution factor formula, you know, increase in pace by increase in weights. Step 4, after I have identified the dilution factor, I will rank this dilution factor. My ranking should be from least to highest. Least dilution factor, rank 1. Highest dilution factor, last rank. Options are always first rank because option dilution factor is 0. 0 divided by anything is 0. So therefore, your dilution factors or your potential equity shares should be ranked in the order of your dilution factor from least to highest. Step 4. Step 5. Considering the ranking, I will try to determine your diluted EPS on a cumulative basis. First, rank 1 I will consider, calculate diluted EPS. Next, I will consider both potential equity shares which are ranked 1 and 2 together calculate diluted EPS. Next, I will consider rank 1, 2, 3 potential equity shares and calculate your diluted EPS. In this way, when we keep on going, always you find that there is a reduction in the EPS. The least EPS of all, worst EPS of all is your diluted EPS to be reported. If in case subsequently at any point of time your EPS starts increasing, such increase is called as anti-dilutive effect. Anti-dilutive effect should not be reported. It should only be disclosed. Clear? So disclosure of EPS should be on the face of the balance on the face of the PNL, and that will bring us to the brief discussion on your index 33, which deals with basic as well as diluted EPS.